The family business of Mountain Laurel Chalets in Gatlinburg has been operating in the area for over 50 years. Working on a limited edition philosophy and stewarded by Tom Goodwin, the company has an enviable repeat market and takes over 80% of its bookings direct. Today, Tom joins me to share how Mountain Laurel Chalet stands out in the very competitive market, how a large percentage of his marketing budget is spent on the guest experience, and why you should always invest with excellence in mind. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information and resources on this rapidly changing short-term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new, and what will help make your business a success. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer, and as ever, I'm super delighted to be back with you once again. Well, we're having a heat wave. It is really glorious here in Ontario as I record this episode. Could change any minute, I suppose. But uh, having just got back from Barcelona and the trip to Europe, I've had a little bit of jet lag And that's lasted about five days. I've been getting up at about four o'clock in the morning, but really immersing myself in working on some new courses for the Vacation Rental Formula Business School that are going to be launched this summer. And, And what we're doing there is helping operators and small managers to grow their businesses by not making the same mistakes that I made. So it's been, this has been super helpful that Brooke Fouts of Vintory has been publishing lists that have been contributed by some of the best managers in this business on his LinkedIn page. And he was asking them, what are the 10 mistakes that you made while you've been a property manager? And I've absolutely been absorbed in these lists because they're just so valuable. And I've been talking about, you know, my mistakes and I made a lot of them over the 20 years in this business. And now there is so much more material that's coming in from all these other managers. And the wisdom in these lists is immense. The honesty and transparency from the managers has been awe-inspiring. And Brooke's going to be compiling all these, separating them out into different buckets, different topics, and we'll be launching a book of them that you'll be able to get from Amazon. So watch out for that. I will, of course, be letting you know when that is available, but I believe you can pre-order it now. Uh, I'll put the information in the show notes. But, you know, when I started out in the business or started out as a property manager 20 years ago, there was absolutely no help from anyone, which is probably why, you know, many of us made these mistakes because many of these managers have been in business a long time. But I remember being met with this great wall of silence when I had a question and I tried to connect with other managers and it was just crickets. Nobody responded to me. Nobody wanted to talk to me. They all had, and I I remember one manager saying, but I'm, what do you mean? You want me to share my secrets with you? This is what it was like 20 odd years ago, that everybody had secrets and was thinking that they were doing it better than anybody else. In fact, there are no secrets. We just, as managers have to, you know, we create our own path. We learn from others and do the absolute best that we can, but we've got so much more knowledge available to us now because now the sharing is just completely awesome. Um, Tom Goodwin is one of those managers who shared his 10 mistakes on LinkedIn. And so many of those really resonated with me. So Mountain Laurel Chalets celebrated 50 years in business last year. So Tom's joining me to talk about the history of the company, the values instilled by the founders, and how they've achieved some really amazing stats in repeat business and direct booking. And he's going to talk about the limited edition philosophy that stands them apart from the competition. And of course, we'll be exploring some of the mistakes he made. (laughs) 
So I'm delighted and honoured to have with me today Tom Goodwin from Mountain Laurel Chalets. Welcome, Tom. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Heather. It's certainly a real treat to be with you today. Well, I've been doing a lot of research, as I always do, and came across podcasts and articles. And then, of course, the uh, the list of your 10 mistakes that you contributed to Brooke Fouts's LinkedIn post. Do you know he now has something like seven or 800 of these, well, 70 or 80 lists, I think it is, which constitutes 700 to 800 mistakes. And it's, uh, it's a joy to, to read through them because as a property manager, it, it, and I'm sure you see this, it's always good to see that everybody else is going through exactly the same thing as you are. Yes, I think I've made all 700 mistakes. <laughs> yes, 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 me too. I read through those and you're nodding. Oh gosh, yes. Um, well, and- it, it is so great that we're opening up and being vulnerable and sharing. And it's, you know, as opposed to the facade and everything's perfect, but just to share the things we've learned that make us better. Exactly. Um, I, I said in the, uh, the introduction to this episode that I loved the transparency and the rawness of some of these contributions. Because I remember, I mean, you've been, well, your business has been going for 50 years plus. I was in my business for 20 years. And, and I remember way back at the beginning that nobody wanted to share a thing. Nobody, you know, you couldn't ask a question and you get this wall of silence. <laughs> um, but now everybody is so open and transparent and it's great. So, Tom, I'd like you to, uh, to tell us a little bit about yourself, but the business, because it has, with 50 years, it has such a rich and awesome history. Yes, and um, I am so grateful that, uh, the way my life has been orchestrated and the woman I met and fell in love with, and I, unbeknownst to me, uh, was the daughter of some pioneers in the vacation rental industry. So Mount Laurel Chalets was started in 1972 mm. in Gatlinburg. At that point, it was the third vacation rental business. Now it is the oldest, the only remaining and uh, we are second generation and preparing for third generation. And everyone knows the statistics of success mm-hmm. of second and third generations. And we're, we're hoping to, to beat those odds. And that has been exciting to continue the 51-year history. But Mountain Laurel Chalets began really out of a heart of hospitality and caring for others in the community. Uh, my mother-in-law, Dot Egley, and father-in-law, Ralph Egley, moved to Gatlinburg because they loved the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They got engaged on top of Mount Leconte. They were married and they had lived um, elsewhere in Tennessee and uh, moved to Gatlinburg to start their family in 1958. (laughs) So uh, very exciting legacy. But by 1972, they were very entrenched in the community and hotels would sell out and there was no way to communicate to people that there were no rooms available. And so Wilma Maples or uh, owner of the Gatlinburg Inn or the Mountain Inn would call Susan's parents and say, do you have a room available? Because we have a couple here, they have nowhere to stay. So my wife and her sister would move out of their bedroom, which was two queen canopy beds with an attached bath and a sliding door to the deck. They would move out and they would provide that room. And so they were a and b mm-hmm. before B&B existed, and they were just uh, helping out uh, the um, hotel owners. And then it kind of spurred into, they were one of the first homes built up um, Ski Mountain Road in Wiley Oakley and Gatlinburg, if people are familiar with that area. They were not paved roads at that time, so they always had four-wheel drives. They lived year-round. Very few people lived year-round. So they would, the other people that owned their own personal vacation homes would give their keys to my in-laws and say, would you watch over my home in case a water line breaks or check the, you know, check the home and for security and safety. And then Dot and Ralph thought, well, there's all these empty homes and there's people that need places to stay. So they started asking those homeowners if they would be interested in renting their homes while they weren't there. And they purchased their first home and they called it Mountain Laurel House. And then that birthed the business in 1972. The first rental was July July 1st for $20 a night (laughs) for a two bedroom. And uh, that began the journey. And uh, they continue to acquire other homes, build homes. And a lot of those original homesteaders in the area would pass away and they would give a first right of refusal to my in-laws to purchase the home. So they began purchasing homes as well. 
I wish we could purchase those homes at that same price today. <laughs> yes. That was a great, great <laughs> business strategy. And uh, before you you know it, by the 80s, uh, they were advertising three times a year in Southern Living. That was the only advertising. And they would there were members of the local chamber of commerce, and um, they were doing very well and uh, continued to do that. And then I got involved with the family when I met my wife in 1991. We married in 92. And she said, oh, by the way, we have some homes that are part of the family that we do in this business. So I got involved just as a family member and a homeowner and an investor in the, in the properties. And then by 2012, bringing this whole story together, how I got involved was that there uh, was some difficulties in the management and the finances that my in-laws were not aware of uh, through the current management. So uh, we started asking questions and realized that we need to get involved in this. And the family asked if I would serve uh, for about six months as the general manager to straight, straighten things out. And uh, it took 18 months to get us out of the wrong curve and towards a profit. And in that period of time, I fell in love with the hospitality and the business and the people in the community. And uh, now my wife and I, uh, my in-laws have passed away in that time. And so the timing uh, worked out really well for our family in the succession to second generation. We righted the ship, got, became profitable, and um, my wife and I are now the sole owners of the business. Family is still involved by owning several of the properties that we manage. Then we took a huge turn in 2016 on November 27th, the Gatlinburg wildfires mm -hmm. came through. And in a matter of two hours, we lost half of our business, oh, wow. 50, 50 of our, actually 48 of our properties, nine of our personal homes. And uh, that began a resetting and a mm -hmm. reestablishing where we were going to go you know, towards the future. That is an amazing, fabulous story. What a legacy. And, and then to come to the wildfire after you'd, you'd come so far and still go forward. It's interesting. I have Sharon Michi joining me in a few weeks to talk about the hurricane and her company, Cottages and Castles of Sanibel. And I know she's going to, to tell this similar story about sort of rising from the ashes, although slightly different from a hurricane. Yes. But yeah, what a great story. But I, I want to ask you about the values that your in-laws instilled in, in you and the legacy of the company. Yeah, my in-laws were amazing, amazing people, um, really driven by their faith and driven by hospitality and caring for others. And so in 2012, when I took over the business, I thought we're, we have such an untapped story here that's not being told. So I hired a brand consulting company and I had done branding work nationally before this. So this was right in my wheelhouse. And we invested a lot of money to capture what are the core values and rebranding, not really rebranding, fully branding the essence and the story of who we were. And in that process, we really did a deep dive of qualitative studies and quantitative studies and research and interviews. And we distilled it to three core values uh, that really have guided the company. So they weren't new core values. We were just expressing what was already true. Mm -hmm. And those are th three things that we believe. So we believe that family matters. Secondly, we believe in exceeding expectations. And thirdly, we believe we are generous stewards. And the family matters really extends to not only our guests, that seems to be the most obvious one, but to our employees and our owners and our vendors and anyone else that we work with. We want to have meaningful, honest, trusted, uh, vulnerable, transparent relationships with those people as is appropriate. And so family drives us. In fact, our tagline is Mount Laurel Chalets, where your family is our company. And that was derived, but my mother-in-law was the queen of hospitality. And whenever anyone came over, they felt like the most special company they ever had. Name tags, mm -hmm. or placed cards at the uh, dinner table, fresh flowers at the bedside, gifts waiting for them. Every, we loved coming home <laughs> to my in-laws because we always got gifts. And it, it was really a sense of um, being a special, special company to them. So that's what our guests had experienced and our owners had experienced. So we really created that Family Matters Exceeding expectations is going above and beyond the surprise and delight. And, and then the last one being generous stewards is that we want to care for our community, the environment, 
the resources that are mm-hmm. entrusted to us by owners. These are the many times their most valuable investment property or investment asset. We want them to have a great return. We want to steward that. We don't own these properties, but we want them to really produce great stewardship for them. And there's also a sense of uh, incredible generosity that my in-laws installed within in, instilled within each one of us to give to others, uh, mm-hmm. to give to worthy causes, to give give back to the community. And you know, it is a little embarrassing how generous they were. And but none of that ever really uh, was wasted giving. It was an investment in other people's yeah. lives. I want to step back a little bit to something you said before, just about the fires, uh, the Gatlinburg fire. How did you recover? What I, mean, <laughs> I know that could be yeah. the topic of an entirely separate uh, podcast, but uh, you know, people will be thinking this. Well, you know, you lost nine of your own homes and it was devastating to the community. How do you come back from something like that? Well, I would say, Heather, our core values drove us and how we responded initially. And it took a matter of days to find out what we had lost, to even know that our <laughs> office was still standing. And so about three days afterwards, we did see on the news that our office was there. But the eight acres all around our office were destroyed. The support walls, uh, the railroad ties that backed up on the end of our property were burned through. The PVC pipes were melted on the side of our building, but our, our building survived. And that our building is right as, as an entry point to the area where the most devastation was, up uh, in the Chalet Village area. So we immediately responded by how do we take care of people? How do we be a part of this community? And um, we rallied with several churches and other individuals that made meals. We had water, we had equipment, supplies, we had bathrooms available to all the emergency responders, the um, National Guard that came in, all the utility people. And so we responded immediately with serving others. And I think that was really instilled in our life as just essence of, you know, how do we respond? And it continued on with, uh, you know, we had 40, I think it was 48 homes that we lost. So these are owners that are devastated, their properties. What do we do? How do we handle insurance? And so we were really the forerunners for them. We handled all their excavation. We contracted out all of the, getting the house or the land and the plot ready. And we coached them through how to file for insurance and how to work in that. So it was a hard recovery, but in 2012, we were facing a very difficult financial time that maybe that no one really knew about, but the financial books were not in order when I took over and we were losing money. So I knew what it was like to lose money (laughs) and I knew what it was like to invest in the future. So when in 2012, we took out loans and we were investing towards the future. And in 18 months we became profitable. So we thought, okay, through the fires, let's, we can press through this and we'll experience loss. But we, had, we hadn't spent all our money that we had earned from 2012 to 2016. Mm-hmm. And so we had money in the bank. We had the ability to, uh, to move forward for 18 months. And we served our owners not knowing if they would even come back to our program or rebuild, sell their lots. Many of them sold their lots. It's, we're done. This is too emotionally difficult for us. And now those are RBO homes and you know they're not on our program. But um, we did what we felt was right in serving others, exceeding their expectations, treating them like family and and giving back to others. And it took about 18 months, again, to turn the business around and become profitable. But we had to scale down, you know, Mm -hmm. from 23 employees to 12 employees, because when you have 120 homes or 100 homes, then you have 48 homes. You know, um, there's a lot of operations that need to be taken care of and 48 homes doesn't cover that. So we really had to begin to build and to grow. But we found a real niche and spot that at 60 homes, we're, we're very profitable. And so that allows us to just scale and grow. And we're up to 70 now. We want to move to 120. Mm-hmm. But we want to do that responsibly with the right amount of employees, the right amount of support, and the resources that we can keep uh, what we call our limited edition experience for our owners and our guests. Yeah, we're going to um, – yeah, let, let's go with that. Let's tell me more about – limited edition because we've we've heard it from Matt Matt Landau he's been espousing limited edition for quite a number of years now and it's always wonderful to talk to uh, operators and managers who apply this philosophy to their businesses and I'd love to hear how you do this and how it impacts on your guests and your owners yes a huge shout out to Matt Landau for this i remember sitting in a 
a meeting and uh, I guess it was the San Antonio VRMA conference and Matt was sharing about the four components of limited edition. Family, local, specialized, or um, surprise and delight, and then specialized. And I thought, that's who we are. <laughs> so it was so nice that someone else had already identified the core of who we were. And I latched onto this and I said, Matt, this is, I, I want to grow in this. I want to champion this and champion others. And so I was so fortunate to become friends with Matt and to have those connections and to network. And that happened at my first VRMA conference in San Antonio. No better person than I could be. <laughs> so, but, so when we had a, a way to identify what limited edition was and what we were, we just began to grow and to dig deep and to think, how can we improve? We are family owned. We are local. And the areas that really energize me is the surprise and delight. And we're specialized just in the Smoky Mountain area. So the area to grow in was how do our guests come away with this sense of, oh, I can't believe you did that. Or you remembered. Or that was so much, so it's extra. With vast competition in the Smoky Mountains, 23,000 cabins and condos, wow. not even including hotels. You know, And we have 70. You know, a small, small, small percentage. But we want all of our return and repeat guests to experience that limited edition experience. And our employees and our owners. So all these core values just don't apply to, to our uh, one audience, but they apply to all of our audiences. A couple of things I want to touch on there. Um, one of them is the really impressive statistics that you have on repeat guests. And I want you to share that. Yeah, we have uh, around 50% of our guests are repeat guests. But the exciting, I think the most exciting is that 20% of our revenue and our guests bookings come from people that have stayed with us five or more times. Mm -hmm. And five is the low watermark. There are people <clears> that have stayed with us 30, 40, 50 times uh, in the 51-year history. They're bringing second generation, third generation, celebrating 30th, 40th anniversaries. And um, they're, they're what we call our family first members. So when you stay with us five or more times, which I think, I don't know that I've ever stayed at one other company or hotel, specific hotel, brand of hotel, yes. But no vacation rental mm -hmm. company five or more times, but we have people coming back three and four times a year. And Gatlinburg's is a drivable location. It's very easy to get to, and all seasons are beautiful, incredible. But we have a family first program, which is our unique niche in a very competitive market. And people just say, I won't rent with anyone else because we've mm -hmm. had, we have history and emotions come with that history and that experience that they tie to a brand and they tie to the people and everything you know about the company. So our goal is to increase our family first members and the, those that come five or more times. Tell us about the su a, surprise and delight though. I, I want to hear oh, how you surprise and delight, not, not just yes. your, well, yeah, all guests, but particularly your repeat guests and the family first guests. Yes. Well, I just wanted to say that we have 2,300 members of the Family First program. <laughs> That's 2,300 so, who have stayed five or more times. That's yes. amazing. It's And it's, you know, thank you, Southern Living <laughs> Advertising in the 1980s, because that's when it started. You can't do that overnight. And I, so I have inherited an incredible legacy. So for our guests, we, we find out why they're coming. What are they celebrating? And they love to tell us. So whether it's a fourth birthday or yeah. a 30th anniversary or a final hospice visit, we want to be involved and engaged with them. So we do, uh, we use an app called bomb bomb and we do personalized video greetings for every guest before they come, wow. welcoming them to their home, introducing us, how we can help them calling them by name and celebrating what occasion they're coming for. So that goes out two or three days before they arrive. And then when they do arrive, if they're having a special occasion, uh, we're making sure that the home is fitted with those elements. Our, Go to is the uh, Donut Fryer is a 51 year company in Gatlinburg, best donuts in the world, and I'm a donut aficionado. <laughs> and uh, we do their homemade cinnamon bread, and we place those in the homes with a personalized greeting. Now, if there's birthdays or anniversaries, you know we do balloons and banners and you know any, any extra elements for that. Our family first members all receive a gift uh, as a part of coming, and those are our T-shirts that we have to keep redesigning and adding new ones because guests will say, well, I have 20 T-shirts in my, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they wear them all the time, but uh, uh, um, we always are looking for other ways to do surprise light. 
I think that is uh, that is amazing. I I did I'm pulling something out of the Unlock podcast where Matt was talking to you, and and I I picked up that you spend ninety percent of your marketing budget on guest experience rather than on Google ads and Facebook ads and and other spend that people yes. would naturally assume would come out of the marketing budget. Yes. And, you know, that was right in the middle of COVID when we were overextended with, you know, stays and we didn't have to invest all the money in, in the Google ads. I would say it's about 70, 30 mm -hmm. now and uh, well worth it. And we've just, we haven't decreased the amount that we do for the specialized for the guests. We just increased what we're doing in our SEO and so forth uh, because of obviously the market has changed since you know, 2020 and 2021. But uh, a lot of those gifts and the personalization, we feel like it's it's worth the 10, 20, 30, $50 of a visit to personalize that for the guest. Yes, I, I love that, that, the whole idea of knowing your guest. And it's not difficult, is it? It's asking, just asking some questions. I had um, years ago at a VRMA conference, the headliner, the, the keynote speaker was John DeJulius and his book, The Customer Service Revolution has been, yes. I mean, it's on my, it's on my bookcase. I dip into it every other day. It's tagged and covered with, with notes. But he talks about exactly that, getting to know your guest. And he talks Ford, which is family, occupation, uh, what they do for relaxation and their desires and dreams. And if you can find, he says, if you can find out those things about your guests, then they will become customers for life. And they want to tell you. Yeah. Everyone likes talking about themselves, right? So listen, I've been talking <laughs> most of this podcast. We all enjoy <laughs> talking about our story and, and sharing it. And how do you bring that out of guests? And in this highly technology-driven hospitality industry, I, we want to use technology, but we cannot lose the human touch and the humanity that comes with being known. Mm -hmm. And part of that is people's names, yes. just using their names and identifying them. Something we're, we're trying and exploring to do and um, took this from an unreasonable hospitality, you know, a, another great hospitality book. But- Google searching the guests as they come to know how, what they look like. So when they come in the office, you're anticipating them. We do a, a Christmas card exchange. My wife came up with this idea. Um, everyone sends family pictures and their Christmas cards. So we asked all of our family first and our, all of our followers on Facebook and our guests to send us their family photo or family Christmas card, holiday card. And we drew one and gave them a, a free two nights day. Mm -hmm. So we received over 200 <laughs> photos of our guests families and we scan those and we're going to be adding them you know to their reservate you know their uh, contact mm -hmm. form uh, through our reservation so there's just a lot of, of ways that you can do that we're we're creating a cookbook so all of our owners are creating their favorite recipes and their memories of their homes and we're asking our guests to do a cookbook and we'll be publishing that uh, this summer but just just ways to personalize and bring it down to a family mm -hmm. sharing level that people would experience. So we've been talking a fair bit about guests and experiences for guests, but I want to move on to owners because owners, obviously the lifeblood of our business. And one thing that I have noticed, particularly love that you get your owners together and you, well, you entertain them, you educate them, but they are part of your family as well. Yes. And this is something my in-laws started over 40 years ago. We're uniquely located in the Chalet Village area. That's where the 80% of 90% of our homes are located. And uh, historically, it's the oldest vacation rental part of, of Gallagher. Mm -hmm. So that neighborhood association has an annual meeting that people come to the last Saturday of April. So my in-laws thought, well, people are coming in for Saturday. What are they doing Friday night? Let's <laughs> have them for dinner. And so they would have a dinner and a meeting and just go over you know, I went to several of those before I uh, started running the business. What do we do with firewood? What about boar bees? And how do we keep trash? And just basic questions that people would have. Now, because of technology, we send out every two weeks a family, a thing called the living room to our owners, which gives them updates on all of our technology, advancements, improvements, questions and concerns that they would have. So our owners are getting a touch point with us every two weeks. How, how, do, so you do, how do you do that, Tom? Is it, is it just a written 
piece? No, or? Our, our marketing director, Jordan Watts, um, takes all the data and the information and the content and creates it through a Canva video. Very oh, simple, right. easy to use. So it's written out words and we insert videos into that. We insert a, a lot of content so it makes it fresh and exciting for our owners. But I realize that I'm not communicating with my owners enough. You know, we're being reactive as opposed to mm-hmm. proactive. So this is a proactive way every two weeks, not overwhelming, five minutes, a five minute video that has content and a personal greeting for me in one of their homes or an explanation of our rep management or our house cleaning, celebrating one of our owners or celebrating one of our employees. It just keeps it, you know, really familiar. So, but our annual meeting then, we've really pivoted and changed it to more of a celebration time. And so we call it a night on Sea Mountain, and we've had it the fr- last Friday of April this year. And I decided, well, let's just do kind of a mini conference or gathering and help educate our owners and also open this to invite all the owners in the area. Oh, so there's right. about, you know, there's right in our central area, I think uh, 1,500 mm-hmm. homes. And so we sent out a Facebook post. We sent out personal postcards inviting owners. And we had 140 people come to our night on ski mountain. We hosted it in the newly refurbished over mountain ski lounge, fabulous new ownership of a 50 year old family company. They allowed us to host it up there. The, um, the president CEO of over mountain came as well as the mayor came, the mayor of Gatlinburg came to greet us. David Angotti was our keynote speaker from stay sense to share about trends. Mm-hmm. Our number one concern, our owners was having, why are our bookings down? Mm-hmm. Why is the, percentage lower than it was in the last two years. We know all those answers, but to help our owners and to educate them. So David did a great job. Travis Welburn with the Hunter Collection came because we're members of the Hunter Collection. Trey Campbell with Explory came because we use Explory as well. We had a comedian to end the <laughs> night, a family. And we, during the business portion, we brought the kids to the other side of the lounge, had games and coloring books and things for the kids to do. But the Comedian was family friendly, of course, because we're family friendly business. And uh, he finished out the night. We also had a, a prodigy banjo player from Dollywood come and entertain us as well. So it was it was a f- exciting night. We had 140 people. 60 of those were our owners mm-hmm. that came. We'd usually have those 60 owners at round tables and have a meal and then share information. Uh, but we also had about 50 potential owners come. Uh, residents of the community, people who are doing it themselves, maybe with other companies, what's going on with Mount Laurel. And they were intrigued by the, the content of what we were sharing. And then we also had our cleaners come, our staff, our, all of our employees, so they got to meet them, and uh, then the VIPs. So I think it's unusual. Most people think, oh, I would never want my owners all to be in the same room because <laughs> they would talk to each other. And I thought, well, then maybe you need to check your core values or your I, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's so natural to have all of our owners together. Mm-hmm. We have a great retention of our owners. I know some other companies think of a 25% attrition. We don't lose our owners. And I, I think we've lost in my 12 years uh, leaving the company, apart from people selling their homes mm-hmm. and leaving, that's, you know, that's an obvious you know loss that you can anticipate. But I think we've had two homeowners that were related that were disgruntled that mm-hmm. left our program. And everyone else to stay, and so it's we're not many, we're but um, we don't need a lot to to do that. So twenty three thousand cabins. I, I don't want to have five hundred homes. Mm-hmm. I want to go to sleep at night, and you know, be profitable in my business, provide a legacy for people. And I think that smaller niche of you know our our initial goal is thinking let's get back up to one hundred twenty, and see if we can still maintain this limited edition experience mm-hmm. uh, for our guests and our owners. I love that uh, that idea of getting them together, but also to invite, and this is one I haven't heard before, in, open it out to other owners because that's, a, that's just a great business move. <laughs> yes, I, I followed up with every one of those owners and you know, there's 40 contacts that I have. The Sunday after the meetings, I met with a couple with three homes that wants to come on our program. Mm-hmm. So we're in the process of transitioning those three homes Several others that are just intrigued. We're watching you. We're interested. And I'm yeah. going to keep those relationships open. Uh, so I think this was a, a great investment, not only for our owners, uh, but for, you know, just serving the community and helping the RBOs. Because 
if if someone is renting by themselves and doing it from a distance and the guest has a poor experience, that impacts all of us. Mm -hmm. And you see all of that on Facebook. And I think there's we're going to be facing a time coming up quickly that those RBOs that thought during COVID it's a great experience are thinking, this is too much work. Yeah. It is a lot of work. Uh, but to have the systems in place and to be available to catch some of that, uh, the fruit dropping from the trees, we want to be available and um, and hopefully, you know, grow to that 120 within the next few years. Yeah, that that is that that is just brilliant. I love that. I hope that people are listening are taking this on board. I mean, if I was still involved with my company, that is something that I would be, start to consider. You know, our business was similar in in terms of values. We in 20 years, we rarely lost an owner, except for, for sale of the property or they're moving back into it. And we did try on occasions to to get them together. Ours were a little different. They were a bit more widely spaced out. But we started a Facebook group for our owners. So here's your own Facebook group, you know, go say hello to each other and we will just pop in occasionally and it was never really it never really got as off the ground as i would have liked it to but i think if i was if i was back there again i'd probably be nurturing that because i think i think they do it's a bit like managers getting together and networking i think owners are more comfortable now with networking with each other there's there's great synergy that comes with that we have owners that have been with us for 4 years that sat with two couples that were not owners and they were doing the same yes. <laughs> yes. of why, why you should be involved. And also in this, in this meeting, we give out awards for best social media presence uh, from our owners, most approved cabins, uh, certificates for, you know, however they're doing remodeling or mm -hmm. adding. So we celebrate the improvements and hopefully that will you know be contagious. We have a memorial award in honor of my in-laws for the one owners that live up to our core values. And uh, it's a real coveted special award. It's a tearjerker, really. Yeah. When these these people realize um, I'm in, I'm involved in something that's bigger than myself, and it's a real special thing. So yeah. Oh, this is such a great conversation. I know it could go on and on, but I I, I need to go back to these list of ten mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, your list of 10 mistakes. I will include your list, if that's okay with you, on the show that's notes great. so so people can, sure. can check those out. But the one that I wanted to focus on, because we're sort of touching on something we haven't talked about yet, and that's really your, your technology. And it was definitely one of my mistakes that um, I didn't word mine as elegantly as you did. I think I said, you know, I, I just, we just spent too much on the cheapest stuff and <laughs> didn't look at how, you know, at, at excellence in the future. But you said, I sometimes misunderstood the value of investing with excellence in mind. I was always looking for a bargain because I went, yes, yes, that's exactly what I was doing. You get what you pay for. I'm learning more and more that spending resources on competent staff, helpful tools and quality services pays off in the long run. Have you got an example of a time when you actually did that? You cut costs and realized later it just wasn't the best economic decision you could have made. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I am not a big car guy. We provide our vehicles for all of our, our inspectors and our maintenance. And so we were, we were doing auctioned trucks that, you know, oh, we got it for 1500 bucks or we got it for 3,500. It was great. And we were always having extra expenses <laughs> and time and being pulled away. And so two years in, Maybe it was three years and then we just bought a new fleet of Jeeps and we put them on lease and, you know, or payments and just took the expense. And then we never had car issues. Mm -hmm. Our employees felt like, wow, I'm driving a great vehicle. It's reliable. It's branded. <laughs> and, you know, that was a very small thing. There's there are other elements, too, that I try to help our owners realize you can scrimp and you can, you know, buy your window treatments at the local box store or you can get something that's, you know, spend your money specifically. Mm -hmm. And uh, decor is huge. It's really important. And I've tried to decorate skimp and, you know, all the thrift stores and everything that I would go to, as opposed to hiring someone that is excellent with that. It's interesting. The homes that we spent the money on for professional design were all selected by the hundred collection. <laughs> so, uh, and two others that an owner was very gifted in that as well. So it, it pays, uh, to, to invest more technology. We built our own website. I didn't know that website companies existed because I wasn't involved in the conference world and the networking. Cause as you said, 
earlier, you know, we had more of a, in, we didn't share our secrets. Mm -hmm. We didn't share our information. Our competition was the enemy. And we were the experts and we knew more than they did or they were stealing from us. So it's a very, uh, I call a scarcity mentality. And I needed to replace that with an abundance mentality. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of room. There's plenty of space for others, others to succeed. There are 23,000 rental opportunities in the Smoky Mountains. There are probably 300 management companies and another thousand upstarts of RBOs in our community. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of room and we can share all of our, our best resources and tools. And you know, uh, back to the question of, I tried to skimp on the branding and then I hired a marketing company and it was expensive when we weren't making any money. We invested $50,000 in the research and the rebranding or the rebirth mm -hmm. of who we were as a company has paid itself off in spades. Uh, it's beautiful imagery, uh, marketing, all the elements, the colors, the tone, the feel, the voice, all of those things coming from experts and really capturing the essence of who we were was well worth that. Uh, there's plenty of other examples of, oh, let's just hire the cheapest entry level employee. And <laughs> what do you get? The cheapest yes. entry level employee. So, you know, we, especially in this market, we're trying to you know be much more generous and competitive with our mm -hmm. compensation with our employees as well. Yes. I, I, I think it, it's so worthwhile just really thinking five years ahead with every purchase. What's this going to look like in five years time? Are we going to need to replace it? Probably if you buy the cheapest, it's going to have to be replaced or, or even three years or two years time. Yes. And we have to replace all of our Jeeps now. So I was like, okay, <laughs> let's go do that. We get, you know, of course, I'd love Land Rovers or something like that, but that's not that's not reasonable. So, so you've um, you've mentioned that you are a relatively new conference goer. You didn't go in in the past, and I it, it was interesting because I, I mean, I've been going to VRMAs for for many many years, and I missed you. <laughs> you know, I would love to have met you <laughs> years ago. Um, but what changed your mind about uh, attending? Well, we were involved in the Tennessee Hospitality Association and the local lodging association, uh, but I didn't realize there was this larger network. I just was unaware. And Amy Highnote brought uh, VRM Intel to Gatlinburg, and I thought, well, I have no excuse. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the convention center, 200 people, and see what this is about. And I was like, you are kidding. <laughs> this is amazing. And met some vendors at we're, we're now working with uh, for our website and our PMS and uh, met some other local owners. And I thought I, I've missed out. And um, so then we joined VRMA, uh, met Matt Landau, met Steve Schwab, met uh, Brooke Fouts, uh, you know, went to smaller retreats or Keystone retreat and, it is paid off in spades. It's just, it's amazing the networking and what you said, I think we're in a new era of abundance as opposed to scarcity. And we want to be a blessing to other people. We want to share our best practices or like Brooke says, our mistakes. <laughs> it's so vulnerable. And I think it's a beautiful thing of what is happening within our industry. And, and it's a sense of community and it's an extension of our heart for hospitality, mm -hmm. caring for other people. And, Honestly, before it was people, com competition was the threat, uh, or we were we never shared our best practices. So uh, I'm not there completely within our community. There are not other players that are coming to the table. Uh, we're, I'm really good friends with Lauren Madewell uh, of uh, Annie Bellum Cabin Rentals, mm -hmm. and we share our best practices and ideas and network. And I want her to succeed. When a home that we visit is not really right for our program and it's right for mm -hmm. theirs, I'm going to refer them to champion them. It's because they are local. They are family owned. They've been in business over 25 years. Um, I'm honest. I am skeptical of a lot of the RBOs and I think I need to, I saw someone wrote, I should have befriended David Angotti wrote on his 10 mistakes should have befriended more RBOs and individual. And he regretted not doing that when he did. It was great. So part of that was our first step this year in inviting other owners mm -hmm. you know, to our program and beginning relationships with them. I know um, up in Ontario when, as I say, when I started out back 2002, 2003, and nobody talked to anybody, and we started our, you know, the Ontario Cottage Rental Managers Association, 
around 2016, I think. And, and it just blew us all away that we could actually get together round a table. We could have a few drinks, we could have a meal and we could share all the things that we all had in common. And, and it, I think every one of us said that was so great because we'd been sitting there thinking, I wonder if anybody else is experiencing the same thing. And then finding that, yes, of course. Yeah. And we'd get together in September, October after a busy summer and and we'd have a you know a wild bitching session for an hour <laughs> and then and then get down to saying okay what can we do about some of these things that are happening with guests coming in and and owners not complying with standards and we just piled in with collective wisdom and it was it was game changing and now I'm out of it I'm seeing I'm seeing how this association is is continuing to grow and it it's it's wonderful I I love to see it that's great. And, and I, I regret the years that I've missed out, but I'm trying to make up for it. The other element that is great, all of your podcasts are online and I've gone back and looked, <laughs> read, you know, gone through the history and some are dated and were relevant to that time period. But I have learned so much from your podcast, from other leaders in the industry podcast. It's John or the Julius's podcast on hospitality is great. I have a lot of drive time and I'm mm-hmm. always listening and learning and some from some great people. Well, that's a great segue into your last comment on your list, which said, I've dreamed of starting a podcast, which wish I'd started one five years ago. I still haven't done it. Ask me again in a year. Well, I'm asking you again in, 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 in two months since you wrote that. What would your podcast be about? Well, I do wish I started five years ago, or you started how long ago? Eight years ago? 13. 13 years ago. Yes. My goodness. So uh, you've, you've stepped into something that, you know, you have that legacy. You know, it's hard to catch up on that. And so I think we don't, probably don't need another vacation rental podcast. There's so much content, you know, that's out there. But I have thought there is nothing really specifically towards my market, mm-hmm. towards Gatlinburg. Yeah. And there are loyal, loyal followers. And I thought there are stories in Gatlinburg that need to be told uh, about the history of the town. The, and I, I want to focus on the limited edi- edition businesses that are family owned, local, specialized yeah, and offer that. So it expands beyond hospitality. But really, every business in Gatlinburg is a hospitality business. So I think there's stories to be told. And I think it would be interesting to kind of do that just on the Gatlinburg market. Yeah, I believe Caleb Hannon at Stay Lake Norman has started one, but very similar. Um, The travel business is so underserved in podcasting. I did a presentation at VRMA a few years ago saying, start a podcast. We all should be starting podcasts in our areas, telling those local stories. Because, and and I think, yeah, I'll be following you now, Tom, okay. and pushing now, you if you need I'm any I'm accountable. Help. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, a- Amber Hurdle said I'll help you. Yeah. You know, Matt said I'll help you. And I, I don't have an excuse, but I realize it is a lot of work. Yes. It's kind of like an RBO saying, oh, I'll just manage a few vacation homes. No problem. I'll just start a podcast. No problem. No, it's consistency and the drive and the discipline to do that is it can't be underestimated. So. Hats off to you for 13 incredible years. Well, thank you. Well, I was, I was in Barcelona last week at the Short Stay Week, and, and I was interviewed by Paul St- Stevens from um, Short Stay Rentals, which is the, 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 the magazine, great magazine, online magazine for industry news. And, and he had, he just, you know, I've, I've got all this fancy equipment. He just had his iPhone with a tiny little microphone attached to it. And I, I, blown away with how simple it is just to go out, whip out the iPhone and start interviewing somebody. And, you know, you can do that. Just, just go and interview all your local businesses. Yeah. We, I could interview our owners Yes, in their homes. Yes. Yes. And what is your story? Why did you invest here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see, this is now going out to, you know, the, 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 the thousand odd people who are going to download this within the first 10 hours of it being published. <laughs> How much time do I have? So, oh, no. so you're going to need to follow up. I will follow up with you. Tom, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you. I've had such fun on this. I will look forward to seeing you. Perhaps not in Orlando. I believe you have a special event coming up that might have you missing that. Yes, my second grandchild is due October 21st. So can't miss that for sure. Absolutely. Might you be in Nashville for... 
the Dom conference in December. I am excited to hear that that is uh, being started up again and Amy High Notes, so I think there's a strong possibility. Okay. Well, I hope I hope I get to meet you then. If not, oh, maybe at another event next dinner, year. Dinner on me, for sure. <laughs> so, And I have been smiling through this entire podcast. It is such a joy <laughs> to be with you. And you're a champion for everything that we stand for in the industry. And that's not to be underestimated, the influence that you have. And uh, I thank you for that. And such a privilege to have this time with you. Yeah, the privilege is mine, Tom. Thank you so much. And, uh, um, and we shall meet soon. Absolutely. What a great conversation that was. I always love talking to property managers. It's, it's, it's an honour, it's a pleasure to spend time with these just ultimate professionals who have so much hospitality in their blood. And I'm, I'm interested <laughs> that Tom's new grandchild will be born in October and, you know, is that yet another potential manager for the future and taking the legacy of Mountain Laurel Chalets even further forward? I won't be around to see that, but uh, it, that, that, that's quite an interesting thing to think about for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, so there were so many takeaways from that conversation. Of course, when you go to the show notes, you get the entire transcription of the podcast. So I used to write long, long show notes and try to fit as much in as I could about what was what was in the episode. But now you can just, uh, you know, I, I'll highlight the, uh, the main points, but you can go to the transcript and read it through to capture anything that you may have missed or, or, or if you were, if you're reading it, you'd like to underline or highlight or whatever. And of course, there will be links in there to the things that we mentioned on the episode, as well as a copy of Tom's uh, 10 mistakes. I'm not sure mistakes is the best word. I think these are 10 gems, 10 gems of wisdom that 70 or 80 property managers have forwarded to Brooke to include in this book because they are all amazing gems of wisdom. So look for that to be coming out. I, as I said at the beginning, I believe there is a pre-order and, uh, and I'll make sure that's in the show notes too. So that's it from me for another week. I've, I came back from Barcelona so fired up, so motivated because I spoke to so many amazing people while I was there. So many of them are going to be coming on the show over the next weeks and months. We are coming up on our 500th episode, which will be broadcast on the 28th of June. And I'm not saying right now who's going to be on the show, but it's going to be a very interesting discussion. So make sure you watch out for that one or listen out for that one, as it were. So I hope you go on and have a great rest of your day or evening, and I will be with you again next week. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.